Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Tez Talks Radio. I'm William McKenzie of Tezos Commons. And we also have today Brian Lee of Tezos hey, Commons. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> How's it going, Will? Pretty well. Uh, so I think this is the first time in a while we're actually recording kind of across the globe. Yeah, I just got back to Tokyo just a few days ago after spending five or six months in the States, much longer than we were expecting to be there. And right. yeah, the journey back was pretty interesting. Like we had an international flight, so it was from Boston to Tokyo and there were only like 18 people on the whole flight. <laughs> oh, Jesus. It was really spooky. So we basically, so they spread everyone like across the plane and uh, we were able to get our own row, which which is pretty great because we were traveling with a small child. But just the whole process was was just a lot to handle. I mean, uh, we we got to the airport like three hours before we were supposed to leave, and then the flight itself was around thirteen hours. And then after that, we had to get off the plane and uh, get tested for the virus. Uh, luckily, it wasn't that long, unlike the States, which where they make you wait, I don't know, two weeks to get your test. Yeah. Uh, yeah I guess there are some faster ones as well. But from what I hear, it's, pr- it's a pretty drawn out process. Uh, a few of my friends almost took two weeks to get their test back. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people in the crypto space work remotely. But, you know, if you have somewhere you're supposed to be physically, like, You know, my family, uh, they're all medical uh, professionals. So if they were to travel out of state or what have you, they would actually be quarantined for those two weeks. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I think that's that's a good thing. If people are going to a different part of 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 the state or of the world, I guess it's it's safer for the rest of the people around you uh, if you do stay home for. A week or two but but yeah we were actually able to get our test back uh within half an hour so <laughs> that's pretty impressive you know uh, they got all of the people on the plane done and we only had to wait half an hour and then we were off uh back home took a special taxi um back home so all in all it was about maybe 18 hours or so and yeah just really glad to be back home in tokyo a bit jet lagged but it's definitely nice yeah absolutely so i guess we can go ahead and get into what we want to talk talk about today uh so it's quite a bit to talk about um one thing i've been particularly noticing and i'm sure also many others especially if you tuned in to our latest text, uh, test talks live episode, which was the other day with Stefan de Bates of elevator returns. Um, it's kind of all this, well, all these developments going on in the SDO space and, you know, even more generally, you know, the markets, uh, crypto markets themselves have been performing quite well, obviously. You don't and, say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Ethereum in particular, you know, I was just looking uh, at total value locked in DeFi. It's over $5 billion now. You know, last time I looked at it, it was something like $2 billion. So insane. Insane. I don't know if it's a bubble. It's insane. Yeah. Kind of nice to see that rising. Uh, I, I think definitely some of that should be attributed to some of the recent price increases we've seen just kind of across the board. But however, circling back to STOs, um, in terms of STOs, you know, Stefan in the live episode the other day, he really went into depth on some of the exciting things that are going on at Elevator Returns. You know, one of those, well, actually multiple of those, being in Asia. You know, recently we heard news of ERX 
which is a trading platform uh, that has been built using Alpha Point's uh, white label software. They actually got their license to launch the, uh, launch the exchange in Thailand. And, you know, just in general, as we all know, uh, government and regulatory entities move extremely slow. You know, it, it takes forever to get stuff done. Yeah. And obtaining this license from the equivalent of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, you know, the Thailand SEC, you know, it, it's really kind of a testament to all the great and intensive, you know, work that's been done by Elevate Returns over the past few years. Yeah. Um, but really, that's not the most exciting part. Um, so let me go ahead and get into that. Um, like Stefan talked about in the live, we have Aspen Coin, which was initially um, conducted on Ethereum. But that contract is actually live on Mainnet now uh, on Tezos. And it will actually become the first tokenized real estate asset to be traded on the T0 platform here in the very near future. Um, so when we think of that, you know, we might say, oh, you know, here, here's another announcement. Um, but if we kind of zoom out a little bit, um, and look at it on a more macro level, I think it's important to understand that T0 is actually owned by Overstock. And, you know, if you've been paying attention to Overstock here lately, uh, their stock has been performing quite well. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I think they're over or around 4 billion market cap right now. Mm. But yeah, the real, the real thing there um, is... Patrick Byrne, you know, his initial uh, vision, you know, he was kind of a, what we would say, a crypto guy. And, uh, you know, a lot of his vision is placed in crypto. Yeah. So we, we can kind of look at Patrick Byrne as a figure similar to Elon Musk, you know, what, what he did with electrical vehicles or electric vehicles, excuse me. Yeah, I but, I really think that this use case is super interesting. I mean, for the people who don't know, uh, yeah. the a, the Aspen coin is what what is it tokenizing? The Saint Regis, it's the Saint uh, Regis Aspen yeah. Hotel. Yeah, so I I believe that they're tokenizing eighteen million dollars or or yeah, yeah or something like that, million. and it will be available for trade mm. uh, on the on the platform and i think this is really interesting i mean i'll have to look more into it to see exactly like uh if you buy the token what are you entitled to you know um are you entitled to like the profits and uh and other things like that uh that the um that the place would receive over time or is it just like an investment into <clears throat> um the value of the property i guess but uh i think like if it is if it does give you like some rights to the profits of the hotel i think something like this is really interesting and really we've never seen anything like it before like imagine if uh you could buy the token um before like a particular part of the year maybe a lot of people go there for christmas and the value of the token will increase as uh, the profits of the hotel goes up. And then, you know, after that, you can sell it, you can bet on it. Uh, like you can bet on um, if the tourism thing around the world is going to like rebound in the future, you know? So I'm not yeah. saying like that's what's going to happen with this coin, but just that use case is something that's really interesting. And it's bringing like, it's basically creating a market where there was not a market before because uh, the only way really to invest in a hotel is really to get in on the deal in the first place, right? It's not right. something that you could just like show up and like, hey, I want to buy like one hundredth of this place. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, also going off what you said there, Brian, there's that instant uh, settlement, you know, instead of stranding or tying up capital for a few days, uh, you know, it's instant. But, you yeah. know, I, I can say personally, um, there will be a lot of positive effects. And this is all I'll say. Um, if the liquidity, you know, around Aspen coin on launching day on T zero is, uh, pretty solid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think just leeching off from that, um, other projects, you know, future ones may look back on it, uh, if proven successful, that you know, it's a positive use case. Um, I think, I think Brian, you actually have a story that you wanted to get into or discuss. Yeah. So another, um, thing that Stefan tweeted about lately, uh, was making a platform for the restaurant industry, uh, you know, just around the world right now, I think a lot of different industries are very impacted. Uh, so, you know, no one's going on planes. You know, there's there was 18 people on my plane. No one's really going out to eat. And the issue when people do go out to eat is that the the restaurants, they're forced to, you know, keep, you know, six or 10 feet uh, between each table. So in the same amount of space, you fit a lot less people. So that ultimately impacts how much profit you could potentially make. So the point here is that there's a real need um, for restaurants to be funded because I don't know about you. I love to go out to eat because there's so many good things around to eat, especially here in Tokyo. You know, we have some of the best restaurants in the world and it would be a shame to see like all of the places that you like go out of business because uh, someday, you know, the economy is going to come back and if all these restaurants are gone, there's like they might not come back, right? So the idea of injecting liquidity into these restaurants right now, and in return, <clears throat> uh, you receive a token that allows you to claim a meal in the future is very interesting. It's basically an ICO for restaurants, right? Uh, you give them cash yeah. now, and then uh, maybe in the future, you can get some sort of return on your investment in the form of a meal. So this is super interesting and uh, they're currently working on a utility token uh, that will, I believe it will be on uh, the Tezos block, blockchain. Uh, and it's going to be a prepaid rewards program um, designed for restaurants. So, you know, the thing about this ecosystem is people are so focused on building things that make sense, uh, which is not always the case uh in other blockchains that i've seen you know they're always trying like these new things maybe those things will make sense in five or ten years but a lot of them are missing like what's what we need now so between something like this uh token for restaurants and stos you know these things really make sense uh in a sense they're kind of low what's the term like low hanging fruit or something yeah. that that is just there control. and you know it's so obvious and now with blockchain you have the uh you're you are able to do this um in a great way and it's inspiring to see like there's actually people here who 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 can see this and who have i guess the knowledge and the experience to execute on it and i guess my story about this is i had the exact same thing that came to mind when when I was in Boston, uh, there were a lot of restaurants, you know, that I, because I actually grew, grew, grew up there, and there were a lot of places I went in high school and basically throughout my life that are doing really bad right now, uh, you know, because no one's going there to eat, and and like the stuff I said before, they're just making a lot less money. Meanwhile, their expenses are not really going down because, you know, they still have to pay rents, uh, they have to pay themselves, they have to pay their staff, and the, the rate where, 
of that decreasing, you know, is not really uh, the same as the rate of business decreasing. So there's definitely an Im imbalance there. Many of these businesses are struggling. So I actually brought this up to quite a few people on another project. I was like, hey, I'm really thinking about building a platform like this, but I think I might need some help because I'm not really a dev. I want to talk about like the best way to do this. And to keep it short, I basically got laughed out of the room because <laughs> they were like, oh, it's, you know, this is not going to work. It's not a, it's, a, it's a bad idea. And, and I just kind of Most good ideas stopped. are usually bad ones. Right, right. Eyes. You know, like I was just, I was really hoping that I could get someone to help me on it. And, and yeah. And after that, I just basically stopped because I had so many things on my mind and thinking about when we could come back to Tokyo and stuff like that. So, uh, but I guess the point of the story here was just pretty funny to see this come up because I was really like, oh, I had this exact same thing come to mind and people laughed me out of the room. And now, this uh, this big company is pursuing the same idea. So maybe the idea was not a bad one. What do you think, Will? Yeah, no, uh, clearly it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> and actually, going off what you said there, um, if you participated in um, or you watched the live event we had the other day, uh, Stefan actually mentioned, you know, the name of this rewards program and, you know, the... Uh, token um, is something called Byte. So I, I believe oh, that's, the that's uh, a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's pretty catchy. Uh, I believe the conversion is is something like eighty cents to a dollar. So pretty much, if you use Byte, and you can only use up to fifty percent of the entire uh, entirety of your meal purchase in mm. Byte, but it's pretty much like a 20% dif uh, discount after you, you know, factor in um, what it's going to cost to get those tokens. But yeah, no, it's, it's definitely something, uh, a very interesting use case for sure. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. And I saw a lot of people bring up like, oh, that's just a gift card, right? Well, not really, because right. when you buy a gift card from one place, you can't exactly use that somewhere else. Yeah, but yeah. Like and, and also going off on that is this is something that you'll be able to, you know, trade and resell too. Yeah. So it's not just a gift card, you know, you go out to the to the uh grocery or you know, gas station or wherever, you know, you purchase uh, a Visa gift card or what have you. you know, yeah. This is something you can resell to somebody else. So I, yeah. I think that's definitely something unique right there. Yeah, just the idea of like tokenizing the value and right. be, being able to like trade back and forth with your friends, I think um, is pretty cool. For sure. So that leads us to our next topic. Um, here recently we learned that BitGo uh, launched the first enterprise grade multi signature wallet and custody solution for Tesos. Uh, Brian, would you like to get into that a little bit? Yeah. You know, there's actually like not a lot to talk about, and <laughs> your intro pretty <laughs> much covered the whole thing. But in case you haven't heard of BitGo, I think, I believe they're based in California and they're really a company that caters more towards like institutions and not just people like you and me who don't have that much capital to hold uh their whole um their whole business revolves around uh being a safe place to be able to store your crypto because a lot of institutions are not really specialized in how to store crypto you know there's a there's a lot of things that you have to think about uh from the security of your infrastructure to um you know how you split it like how you split your keys across different people to decrease the risk of something bad happening someone so, dying yeah or someone dying or you know uh, maybe two or three people get together and sign a key and they run away with all the money i don't know like there's 
a lot of things that you need to think about. So often, um, institutions will actually go with a provider like BitGo. I think uh, Coinbase Prime um, also offers Coinbase things. Coinbase Pro? Like... No, there's actually an institution product called Coinbase Prime. Oh, uh, I haven't so, heard of that before. Yeah, there's, there's Coinbase, um, Coinbase Pro, and Coinbase Prime. So Prime is really only available for business entities, I believe. And um, I actually do have a Coinbase Prime account um, for a business entity, but but yeah, like it's like things like that is really important for the growth of the ecosystem. Uh, I mean, like crypto as a whole, because it really means that if people are spending a lot of funding in order to build out this infrastructure, it basically means like it's important, you know, they're not like these people, they're not just going to like burn their cash and build this for uh for a joke it's not really a joke right if they're been, if 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 they spend so much to build all this out so uh it's definitely a good thing and just in terms of tezos uh bitgo is going to provide staking as well so if you're an institution who wants to hold xtz uh you can do so with bitgo and uh, you'll be able to um, earn from staking. So BitGo does support a lot of crypto. So uh, it's, pr it's a pretty big company, pretty well-known uh, entity in the space. And I think it's a great thing that they're supporting XTZ now for uh, their custody. Absolutely. You know, the more the merrier. I don't think there's a whole lot much left to really talk on that. Um, so we can just go on and talk about our next topic, which um, is ZK, ZK channels. Um, previously, <clears throat> I uh, made a post on that on Tesla's comments, which we will link below in the description. But um, I guess we can go ahead and kind of start off talking about privacy. So, you know, we've seen lots of privacy coins, you know, like Monero. Uh, I think the big one back in 2017 was Verge. You know, we haven't seen anything. But Verge, Verge. wasn't really actually private, right? <laughs> well, there's the Wraith protocol, you know. Yeah. That, that was really big. Uh, but yeah, I guess you're kind of right on that. But anyways, um, Privacy is a very strong use case for blockchain technology, in my opinion, and you know also kind of the social dynamic around a lot of blockchain enthusiasts. You know, uh, a lot of them like anonymity. Uh, anonymity. We have zk channels, which uh, they're going to be building this uh, privacy-preserving payment solution, and uh, Tezos is going to be the first chain that I believe they integrate with along with uh, Zcash. And um, it's going Bitcoin, to right? be like a layer two yeah. uh, off-chain mechanism. So, you know, if we look at something like Bitcoin, which utilizes the Lightning Network, um, that's a layer two mechanism. So all those transactions uh, happen off-chain. Um, yeah. But... The important distinction here with ZK channels between like some of the previous um, coins I brought up earlier, like Monero, for instance, is scalability is a question. Um, you know, when you're using something like ZK channels, it does not sacrifice scalability uh, since it's off chain. I think it's important to like talk about what off chain exactly means so right so like when i think about off chain it's like you can kind of think about it like if you're in a zoom room or something with a bunch of different people and everyone can see you and you can see them um i believe in zoom there's actually a function called like a dropout room or like fold out room or something where like you and someone you choose can just go in a separate room 
So in that case, once you have your own room, you can do whatever you want. And so that would be like the layer two. And the layer one would be the entire room with all of the um, guests, right? So right. the other guests like know that, like know when you uh, left the room and they know when you came back, but they don't know what happened in that room um, when you were in there with uh, the guest of your choosing. So uh, this is kind of like that. And basically it, it allows you to set up a payment channel with uh, someone. And within that channel, you can do as much back and forth as you want. Uh, it's off chain. It's like in your own room. And also the fees are much lower because uh, you're not, you know, doing on chain stuff. Yeah. And just kind of extrapolating on that, you know, there's like Brian said, it's a payment solution, but there's going to be some level of uh, information. You know, one of the two parties interacting with each other will know. and. Um, it's actually the starting and final balance. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, as that progresses, you know, you begin to lend in certain increments of value. That's when you start to get more uh, privacy. Well, I you know, think you, these things are, are really important, especially for like discretionary spending, I guess, where, you know, right. it's not really important. Like, for example, if you go buy a coffee or uh, if you just go to buy your groceries or something like that, there's like you're not buying a house like that's different, right? Like if you just go go out and buy something simple, there's no reason why you need to break out like Bitcoin uh, or something that's going to be slow uh, because these small purchases are much less important, um, you know, in the context of your whole life. So I think it's important to have uh, really fast payment options that are also private because I don't really want uh, I don't really want my purchase history to be recorded on a blockchain uh, like step by step, right? Like at 5 p.m. you went to the shop to buy this and then you went somewhere else and then you spent Bitcoin here. You know, if you have all of that info, um, someone could like make a map of your life and that's kind of creepy so by making an option that allows for privacy where that stuff wouldn't be directly recorded on the blockchain and also um, the identities of uh, the, cu the customer and the merchant are protected it's, it's really important for, for adoption yeah, and you know, like you kind of touched on <clears throat> a little bit earlier, um, I think the fundamental focus is really on uh, these quote unquote building blocks, I guess, uh, these channels, ZK channels, and being able to have privacy uh, and maintain it the best way possible without, you know, sacrificing scalability. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see um, how this evolves over time. Uh, right now, it's being developed by both labs. Uh, that's B-O-L-T. And they have options for Zcash, Bitcoin, and Tezos, you know, as kind of um, an add-on integration that can be, uh, that can be um, put on basically any blockchain, uh, as long as someone is there to do the work. So, yeah, def definitely check it out if uh, something like fast and private transactions is something that appeals to you. I guess we can go ahead and get to our last topic that we wanted to discuss today. Um, and it's something I'm sure, well, I know for a fact, everyone within the <clears throat> Tezos community has been talking about for months now. Zeus is Capital. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, which by the way is quite funny, you know, because recent yeah. price increase, but it's protocol 007. Um, you know, Blockwatch put out a really good article 
And uh, quite a few people liked and shared it across Twitter. But um, Brian, would you like to kind of touch on a few things from uh, the independent review that Blockwatch did? Yeah, sure. So Protocol 007, also called um, <coughs> James Bond, <coughs> James Bond, uh, codename Delphi. I think it's pronounced Delphi, right? Yeah. Uh, something in Greece, so, something to do with Greece or ancient Majority Greece or something like that. Of all yeah. upgrades have that <laughs> origin. Right. Yeah. So there's a number of um, important upgrades updates that are coming in this upgrade and and yeah we're just gonna quickly step through them and give some thoughts uh if you're interested in uh, more discussion about um this upgrade i would also recommend checking out the previous episode we did uh with rob from polychain labs uh we we really dived into a number of topics uh including uh, this upcoming upgrade but uh, the the biggest thing that's on the table is um, Baker contract addresses. So right now, uh, when you sign up for a Baker, you know uh, you get a implicit address which which starts with TZ one two or three, um, followed by a bunch of random numbers and letters and that's really the only way to identify yourself as a baker right now. And uh, the way that the system is, is designed, there is not really a way to add additional um, parameters uh, to expand the paradigm of your identity. And that's going to change uh, in this upcoming upgrade. So baker accounts are being shifted. Uh, they're being turn into a multi-sig smart contract instead. So uh, if the upgrade passes, uh, the identity of a baker will actually be a multi-sig smart contract address uh, that starts with SG1. So what this allows for is, I think it allows for uh, you know, the identity to contain more important information that also allows you to have more complex functions um, for the baker, and those things together can have a positive impact on the security and flexibility of the network in the long term. So, for example, um, some of the extra extra things that this smart contract will allow for is you can bind things like. Uh, a you can basically do a multi-sig spending and voting so um that's pretty cool because instead of just one person or one key uh having 100 percent of the control if your team has five people you can say like oh uh three people and their keys have to be um have to be there in order to sign this uh smart contract request so that's really good for security because if a hacker or something gets the key of one person you know it's not gonna uh allow them essentially to you know spend all of the funds or um do other kind of malicious activities so that is really great for uh the security of the, of the network and it also allows you to rotate con consensus keys uh so that would allow you to build in uh, some sort of key rotation scheme into your uh, into your operations, I guess. So maybe every three months, just because you want to, you know, you switch the key. I don't know if that's actually more safe, but um, the uh, the yeah. options there, yeah. And actually, going off on that, you know, this has been something that's been, you know, even we talked about on uh, the podcast with Rob, you know, it's something that's been pretty contentious uh, within the community for quite a while. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to, you know, look at this and form formulate their own opinions um, on how they view 
these changes specifically with <clears throat> new Baker accounts. Yeah, I think that I really like the idea because, you know, we also run a node on a different network and uh, the industry in the world will evolve over time. So having the flexibility to adapt to new standards in um, how you design your infrastructure, I think is, is really powerful. Uh, and, oh, and overall, I think this is a really great thing. So like a few of the other things, uh, there's also PVSS key, which uh, is a key that will help generate a random number. So, uh, you can do that in a decentralized fashion, which is which is actually it turns out to be quite difficult. That's similar to what Chainlink is doing, isn't it? VRM. Yeah, Chainlink is also yeah. doing the random number thing, and it's and 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 something like that is really useful for certain kinds of DApps. So, um, stuff like uh, gambling things and. Um, Actually, a lot of selection, yeah, right. And like, like a lot of apps out there really rely on being able to uh, randomly generate a number. Because if it's not random, you know, if there's a way that you can actually reverse engineer it, then it makes the whole app worthless. Because people can just game this game the system. So um, having that capability is is a really great thing so uh in terms of in terms of like general compatibility the idea and the way that this is designed uh it's supposed to allow for backwards compatibility with uh the old implicit addresses but all of this is new technology and i think a core point of the post was that if you if you are a company that offers like a service or offers some kind of um, in infrastructure thing for the network, you really want to take a look at if this is going to affect uh, your service. Because on a macro level, uh, it can be backwards compatible, but you know all, all of this is software. And depending on how deep you get <clears throat> uh, and exactly how <clears throat> you implement the APIs in your your uh, in in whatever you're trying to build, you know there could be really interesting edge cases that may need to be fixed or may need to be debugged. So, uh, so if you are a provider of a service in the ecosystem, it's it's definitely worth uh, playing around with the test net, um, with the Delphi test Delphi test net, and uh, testing if everything is going to be okay. And the testnet is in a pretty early stage at the moment. So as the year progresses, uh, I'd really, I'd really recommend people to to do testing if uh, something like this is going to affect your application or something else in even the smallest way. Moving on from that, probably the most notable and biggest change that is coming with O Seven is. Uh, sapling integration. You know, this is something that's been discussed for months. Um, and kind of going off what Brian said previously, I just remember what I was going to say. Um, it's understandable to see how long this protocol upgrade has taken to come because it's, I would say, arguably probably the biggest protocol upgrade that Tezos has experienced thus far. Uh, so sapling integration is expected in this upgrade. And, um, for those of it, for those of you who aren't too familiar with, um, sapling, uh, within there's zero knowledge proofs and, you know, within a zero knowledge proof, you know, value can be exchanged between parties without revealing uh personal or sensitive data you know kind of touching back on previously what me and brian discussed about with uh zk channels so you know neither the sender 
nor a receiver can have their personal information uh, compromised. So something like sapling integration coming to Tezos, you know, it, it can have quite a few use cases. Uh, I think probably the most notable use case and something that I touched on a while ago on my personal blog was the potential usage within uh, Bank of France and um, some of their commercial banking locations. Because uh, if we look back, you know, previously they tested a Tesos node and um, they also participated in a T quorum panel. And one of the um, key points that Jean Baptiste of their digital assets um, part of their um, company touched on was the need for fine tuned privacy. So, something like sapling integration will present that fine tuned privacy. And beyond just banking in general, there's quite a few other use cases. Uh, what say you, Brian? Yeah, I think it's a great thing to have for any platform. And especially in the world we live in now, where there's such a core focus on, pri- on pri- privacy and you know all of these uh, things on the web, uh, people are getting really passionate about not being tracked. And I just think the whole idea of remaining private is just ve- it's just very appealing you know there's so many of these big tech companies that are arguably gaining too much power in uh in terms of being able to track people and being able to um essentially design their their uh how do how do I want to say this to design their interactions with like a, a specific app um that is based on the information that right. was learned from tracking. And uh, that's kind of a scary thing if, um, if you really think about it. And so I, I think that um, any kind of private integration for the blockchain is great. And the only thing that uh, Blockwatch um, brought up was, you know, the... I guess the uh, degree of the of uh, the integration is not as strong as it could be. So they were so in instead of having like a global pool uh, for these private smart contracts to derive the privacy from, you know, each of this each smart contract will have its own pool. So effectively, it makes uh, I guess the it. Like it makes each pool less private, and what I mean by that is like it's pretty easy to understand. I think if you're trying to run away from someone, uh, would you rather go into a crowd of ten people or go into a crowd of a thousand people? Right. So uh, if you end up in a crowd of ten people, the chances that you'll be found, the chances that uh, the the chance of that will be much higher. So. By each smart contract having its own pool, uh, instead of having all of the sapling smart contracts share a global pool, um, that will that will effectively reduce the privacy. But but at the same time, you know this is just the this is just the first step. So we really don't know what's going to happen. Like there might be a thing where. Uh, so many people and so many different entities use these pools that uh, the degree of the privacy as compared to a global pool really is not that much different. So it just really depends on how the use cases play out. And I just really think it's a good first step towards integrating a private kind of functionality uh, onto the Tezos blockchain. So very excited about that. And if this was something, you know, presented uh, with a dollar figure tied to it, uh, I believe it would probably be a million dollar uh, proposal 
because there's a lot of work and it's, I would say, inarguably the most significant upgrade that's come to Tezos yet. Yeah, I think between Sapling and the change to uh, the structure of the Baker identity is like, I, th- I think this, this upgrade is definitely uh, the biggest one that has happened yet. So, you know, just to, just to wrap it up, there, there's like a few other small things that are coming in this upgrade as well. So I believe they're going to add a fifth adoption period uh, to, pro- to basically provide more time um, for the network to upgrade uh, after a vote is accepted. So um, this is another thing that I really like about Tezos. It's not really, it's not rushed, you know, it's uh, predictable, which is very important for institutional adoption. You know, they want something predictable. It's not like these other blockchains where the core dev team just decides to do, just decides to do like an upgrade um and then they vote on it and then right after that it's just like hey let's go live now yeah and there's definitely been an increased urgency towards testing uh especially after the babylon upgrade yeah i mean all of these things should be tested and i just like we are active on some other blockchains as well and it's just like the idea of rushing these integrations where like the blockchain is itself like based on market cap you know it's worth sometimes hundreds of millions or like billions right like why are you rushing and putting all of right. that market cap on the line especially when value is exchanged daily you know and especially like if there's these companies out there that actually like rely on on the blockchain uh in order to run their business so you know there's this um adoption thing they're going to add a fifth period to it which which is great and uh there's also another there's also another upgrade which will allow bakers um and the delegators to split their voting power uh between yay uh nay and pass so uh, i really like i really like pass because some because that really lets you that that lets you express different shades of gray like we were right w- without having to completely disagree with something i don't think many things in life are yes or no there's always a maybe uh those were pretty much all of the things that were discussed uh in the article from blockwash there's a few other developer kind of code things talking about mickelson extensions and uh and stuff like that but if you're a developer and you're interested in all of these um new extensions and, and and types and instructions that you can use to build on tezos i definitely recommend checking out the article that um that was written by blockwatch do you have anything else to add will well i have one thing i would add like we said previously uh if you have not checked out the previous test talks test talks live episode with stefan de bates I would highly encourage you to check that out. There's a lot of good points mentioned in there. And obviously, uh, we're going to link all the rest of the topics that we discussed below. So other than that, I think that is goodbye. And we will catch you on the next episode of Test Talks Radio.